all I remember was that uh, the uh, well, Greek historian said that the, 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 the people of Ar Arcadia, as he called it, right. were, were, were be bestial. Really? They were uncivilized because they had no music. I thought that was an, an interesting description of a, of a people. And it's sort of a conflict of the, it, it, it fit Arcadi to some degree. He's a, he is a, um, over six books now. He, he has evolved into someone I find more interesting all the time. And uh, someone a little closer to violence as he, get, as he gets older. How is it that Stalin's Ghost is the shortest um, in time that, that between your last book, Wolves Eat Dogs, and Stalin's Ghost? Is a fairly brief time for you? For me, yes. Me and an elephant. Um, I think it's because I'd just done another one, another one before, the, the uh, Chernobyl book. So I had Arkady still in my mind. I had the other characters fresh in my mind, Ava and, and Genya. And, uh, and I felt I felt that it was, I had a curious feeling, I liked the way that book ended, and sort of driving off into the, into the snow, and there was, there was a fair amount of menace to the, to the scene, the last scene. Right. And I just wanted, I wanted to see what happened when they got to the end of the road. And so it followed very naturally. They don't, they're not dependent on each other in, in any way. Right. But, but I felt something must have driven you, because yeah. so often you go off and do something different and then come back. Yeah, and I'll do that again, because I've got some other ideas that are very tempting. But I, I want to I see Arkady through. This is a very curious uh, time in Russian history. Very. I enjoyed the interview that you did for, I believe it's book page, about your Chernobyl book, We'll See Dogs. Yes. And I hadn't previously thought about the idea that the as a technological disaster and also as a... Uh, it opened such a credibility gap mm -hmm. that at least you say in that interview that you felt that that was one of the things that really cracked yes. uh, the Soviet Union and caused it to break apart. Yes. Was the sort of inexplicable way that both it happened, not so much that it happened, because it might have always been there waiting to mm -hmm. happen, but the way it was handled. Well, the way it was handled was, of course, to deny it. Now, to give one man rushes into the reactor uh, hall. And he comes back and he's already dying and he says, the core is gone. It's blown up. And the foreman who's been running this, this, this experiment very crudely and badly and now is facing the consequences, sends another man down. He comes back. He's dying. And he says, the core is gone. And the manager says, it can't be gone. It can't be gone. But I have to, well, I have to phone Moscow. And, and, uh, and so he calls Moscow, and it's somebody groggy picks up the phone at the other end. He says, well, we've had an incident here in Chernobyl. And uh, he says, and the, the question is, wh wh well, the core, what about the core? The, how was the core? And the foreman in Chernobyl says, oh, the, the core is fine. Don't worry about that. So there is misleading uh, information right from the beginning. And of course, once they find out that the core is gone, this incredible catastrophe has taken place, they don't tell the public. They let May Day parades go by, uh, be performed in uh, Kiev, hundreds of thousands of children walking through radioactive isotopes. And of course, they don't tell Belarusia. Uh, they don't tell anybody until they're, they're, until they're forced to. And by then, the people, and the people of Pripyat, this town of 50,000 people living next door to the, uh, to the reactor, uh, are evacuated in a day. But they're thinking they could have evacuated us three days before. Sure. And all this time, there were the children who had been uh, sitting at home, playing outside, kicking up radioactive dust, drinking radioactive water, playing with radioactive pets. Uh, that's the kind of thing that finally, finally draws the, the, the Russians' uh, ire. Well, not because, not because they're surprised by it, but it, it confirms their worst feelings, their worst suspicions about the, about the uh, authority. And it certainly undercut Mikhail Gorbachev. Right. Absolutely so. Do we know how many people, I mean, have a lot of these people died? Or, you know, are they sort of laboring on with various horrible problems from the radioactivity? Well, the estimates range from 100 to 100,000 to 200,000. Um, uh, it's sort of how you measure it. And people look at the way the Russians measure things sometimes. The uh, for example, there was a 
the unit, I forget what it's, the scientific unit is, but there were five of these units um, allowed for milk uh, for, the, for it to be consumed and not deemed radioactive. Right. So the five was the limit. Comes Chernobyl, all this radioactivity, all these cows, all this, all this milk now registering at 25. What to do with all this radioactive milk? Do you toss it? Do you, uh, do you find some place, some waste site, top waste site? Or do you ingeniously, as the Russians did, suddenly raise the radioactive limit to 25 and move, move the milk from one category to another? And so the, you know, the, the people saw, saw that. And again, their worst, they saw this bureaucratic sure. chicanery. And um, again, validated their, their worst suspicions. And as for how many suffered, they, uh, they feel that, that, that humans are now being moved from one category to another. At the very least, all these millions and millions of people, particularly children, suffered a, a, a blow to their health. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's blood. I mean, you get leukemia, you get bone, yeah. you get all kinds of awful things. But this is a country that, that has, I mean, this is a country of Stalinist purges where millions died, and this is a country that's always had a really horrendous history in terms of, you know, well, now you're, now magnitude you're, of people dying. Now you're talking about the, 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 the new book, Stalin's Ghost, because to me, what, what started me on this trail was that here was Joseph Stalin, who had responsible for the deaths of approximately, who can say what? approximately 20 million Russians right. sent, uh, he starved to death 7 to 8 million Ukrainians. Um, he, would ha he would just give a, a town a quota of you know, 5,000 or 10,000 enemies of the people to be, to, to be sent to the Gulag, to, uh, to, to prison in Siberia. And yet, um, a popularity poll shows him uh, deemed to be uh, by 53% of the Russians interviewed, a positive element in Russian history. This is a recent poll? Yes. I was fascinated reading Stalin's Ghost to show a sort of resurgence of interest in Stalin, but when I was in St. Petersburg the summer before last, I was also interested to see that the, there used to be a lot of statues to Stalin. Yes. And of course even more to Lenin. And all of the Stalin are gone, Mm -hmm. And the Lenin has been cut from 40-some to five. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to, now is that just the government seeking to erase them, whereas... Well, the government is, is, is reacted uh, since uh, Khrushchev's denunciation of uh, Stalin. Right. Um, that's when, that's when the, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, busts of, omnipresent busts of Stalin disappeared. And then came the, uh, the uh, Perestroika, and then the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the rest of the statues of Stalin disappeared. But they've been, but these statues have been making a subtle comeback. I see them in different places, in, in different offices. I'll see a statue of Jerzinski, who was the first uh, head of the secret police, or I'll see uh, uh, a portrait of of Stalin, and, and then I read, uh, I talk to Russians. And they say, yes, yes, there were the purges and millions died, but when you chop wood, chips fly. And he uh, defeated the in invaders from Germany. He, he's, the one who, he's the man whose iron will uh, never broke, they feel, and uh, saved, saved Leningrad, Moscow, Stalingrad. Any other leader would have would have surrendered those cities, and they're right. And then when they say, you know, the fact is, Russia saved the world from Hitler, and they're right, just like it did for Napoleon. It's so I've always been fascinated with that. You know, the fact that Hitler was totally unable to draw the parallel. Well, that he, it, 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 you have to, of course, <laughs> the inability to draw parallels. Is is, uh, is 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 so such a ripe subject. We could, be <laughs> well, we, really we, could. we could go in that direction. Absolutely. But. So 